So we have one more session coming up before we have the closing. And this is another session where I would very much like to create a hot seat, let's say, because I know there are, again, many people who can contribute to this discussion. Uh, we've heard a lot about making and open hardware and technology today. That is a very big part of what GIG is about. And our members have shared in the most beautiful way how these different perspectives on innovation have cross-pollinated each other at GIG over the years. So um, that's very much what we're about. But we're not just about... Uh, physical, digital innovation, and hands-on tech. We also do a lot of work in the context of policy work. Um, as Andrew was mentioning earlier, these kind of connections, this bridges building, this translation work, that is also a lot of what GIG is doing to make sure that all these diversity of voices doing this work and working on these topics are also heard on a global scale. And that is what we want to discuss in this final panel session or little uh, interview session that we have coming up now. We are all new actors. Innovation hubs are new actors. Digital innovators are new actors. Makers are new actors. How do we make um, governments, politicians, executives see us and give us that seat at the table in order to have these policy dialogues? And some of us have been working exactly on these topics and that's what we want to discuss now, and I'm super excited to welcome on stage with me Felipe Schmidt-Fonseca, who is a Berlin-based Brazilian activist, free and open advocate, and currently also a researcher working at his PhD at Northumbria University, and they're investigating waste prevention and generous cities in the Open Do TT project. But Felipe has a long background on exactly what I was just mentioning in my opening words, connecting communities, connecting and translating between the worlds of culture, science, technology, and openness, and also making sure that it's heard on the policy side. So please give him a big round of applause and welcome to the stage. And I'm so excited to welcome back on stage Linda Bonio. She is a digital law expert working on digital policy and justice innovation across Africa, but also globally, really. She consults different organizations on topics such as digital identity, trade policy, privacy, and security. And she's the CEO and founder of Lawyers Hub in Kenya that is doing such important work, really building up yeah, capacity of legal people working in the digital rights field. So great to have you here, Linda, please come and join me here on stage. So as, um, as with the others, I'd like to give you a bit more space to talk about your work and um, how you have, as civil society representatives, organizations, have also been instrumental in shaping these yeah, these discourses, these processes to get more, more seats at the table. And Linda, if I can invite you to share how you work at the Lawyers Hub and how you're doing this in Kenya, but also globally first. Um, in Africa, we have to check this. Is it working? <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, hi everyone, and it's lovely to see you all here. Um, the Lawyers Hub works on digital policy. That's like the most um, accelerated work that we have. Um, it was crazy in the beginning, but we've sort of formed it into um, three work streams that we think we are passionate about. So the first thing that we do is we run the Digital Policy Institute. Uh, we got a, a fund from a media network um, three years ago to develop uh, digital policy talent in the continent because we saw that governments were you know, really struggling with um, coming up with new laws at record speed and amending old laws. Um, and we thought that we could rewire and reskill, especially lawyers and technologists, to be part of the policy making process. We've, been, we've had three cohorts, um, and the last cohort had uh, 15 fellows. This year we are taking 30 fellows, and we began um, doing it in Kenya, and now we've scaled it across the African continent. Um, so we think that's a really incredible work, um, really tying in with what everyone is doing. Um, the second piece of work that we do is we run this um, Africa Startup Law Accelerator where we are offering technical support to startups. We realize that African startups especially don't have the same opportunities like everyone. Um, competition is difficult, access to um, lawyers is expensive, and so we run this program, um, and we've been doing this for the past three years as, as well. And then the third intervention is we do the Africa Law and Tech Festival. 
So it's a convening of different players. Uh, we've done it for the last three years. The next edition is um, in, oh my God, it's next month, um, in, in Nairobi. Oh, uh, gosh. Guys, pray for us <laughs> and send money. Thank you. Um, so we bring together over 2,000 lawyers and technologists to come into the room and talk about digital policy issues that they are facing. Last year, we had some good convenings on AI and policy and what Africa could do to move forward. Um, and now we're really impressed by the general mainstreaming of, you know, of the conversations on AI. Uh, so those are some of the work that we do. But I'd want to just maybe give context on some of the laws that we've been trying to be part of. Um, um, we've realized that there's opportunity to be part of bigger, bigger conversations. For example, consulting for the UN in Africa um, made us part of the Africa Data Policy Framework. Um, and so we were part of convening that. But also in Kenya, uh, during the conversations on digital identity in 2019, uh, there was a lot of calls for we need a privacy framework for us to adopt digital ID. And so we began these community convenings um, and asking people to come and attend, speak about a particular topic. Uh, we ran policy hackathons across the country, and we saw the general uptick by people now demanding for better, um, and also policymakers inviting us to now become come to parliament and make submissions. And so just away from doing work in Kenya, it's grown towards the global convenings. We are now partly um, really part of the digital compact with the UN Tech Envoy, um, the conversations at the African Union on different levels, and we've seen what like that grassroots sort of convening can then become something that's regional um, and also can be scaled to, to um, regional conversations. So in a bit, that's, that's what we do. Fantastic. One more comment, please, perhaps on a uh, situation also on a national level with your government. I mean, I used to spend a bit more time in Kenya and uh, be part of conversations saying things like there's such a vibrant and popping digital ecosystem in Kenya. All that is uh, despite, not because of the government you have. So what does that kind of, you know, making people see the work you're doing and understanding it? I'm sometimes guessing it's easier on an international than on a national level. What does that look like for you? Um, so we've gone through these different stages um, of maybe love-hate relationship with government. In the beginning, it was on Uduma number, which was emotive because there was a lot of funding involved from other players. And with the lawyers, there are people who really love us and the people who don't like us. And we are fine with it uh, because we like to take certain positions, which, you know, um, not everybody likes. Sometimes corporates don't like it. Sometimes people don't like it. Um, but then what we realized is that we become this forum where everybody's view really happens. So we are able to invite government to speak, civil society. And so we then now shifted into how do we make sure that we're just not taking a position, but we're making sure that everybody's hard in the room. So in terms of budgeting, for instance, um, having you know everybody in the room have their voice on, I think if you allocate this amount of money, this is what's going to happen. If you tax startups, this is what will happen. You know, And letting everybody see the effects of, of, of that kind of work. Um, and then two, we also, Kenya is great for innovation. A lot is happening, but it's not the most ideal environment. Um, when I come to Europe, I, I, I'm impressed that you're waking up at nine o'clock, you're in the train, going to work, you, you know, listen to a podcast and then you have a shake, you know, before you start work. We don't have that kind of luxury, you know? Uh, we suffer. Um, and um, I, <laughs> no shake. <laughs> We sit in traffic, you're wondering why Africans are late because we don't have the train system you have. Why are you late? You know, we should be late. Um, so anyway, uh, given that context, <laughs> entrepreneurship is really hard. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to make sure, um, one, and I say this to the Americans, that American big tech companies don't take over Africa because it's happening and our startups will not innovate. Uh, it's easier to work at a big tech company than to start your business. And we're trying to change that and saying, can we have better tax policies to ensure that actually small businesses thrive? I like the balance that India has had, that at the end of the day, um, the Indian Dukawalas must thrive as the other external companies also come. I think it's useful for the world when there's competition. And so those are some of the stuff that we are trying to work on. Oh, so important. You know, I'd like to continue another half conference day just talking about that because those are totally our topics. Um, but let's take us on a little trip to Brazil. I know you're based here at the moment, Felipe, but if you could take us there. I learned something yesterday from my fellow executive board member, Ricardo Ruiz, who told me that in Brazil you have a, a, a situation that's different to here, at least I would say so, which is the close affiliation when it's there 
between a leftist government and civil society. And when this government takes office, it draws everybody from their NGOs into government. I thought that was super interesting because we don't really have that happening here in such a stark way. So I was going to ask you a question anyway today about volatility in government and how difficult it is to deal with that. But now I learned you have very many different ways of volatility of, of how to interface with government and civil society. So, Cher, can you tell us about how that works in Brazil, please? Yeah, well, uh, I think I'll be talking a bit about uh, water and wind. So, I am Amayo Shun, Epa Oya, and my name is not Georgia. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting because 10 years ago I was at the first gig uh, event during Republica with Georgia. Georgia actually invited me. And 10 years before that, I was involved. Uh, I started getting involved with open source, cultural, digital policy in the kind of progressive government that took, uh, took power in 2003, early 2003. And uh, that story was told a lot of times. And I guess me and uh, myself, Ricardo, and other people wrote a kind of superficial account about that story in which you tell you know, the best parts of it, like we talk about uh, our projects to funders. But I think it's interesting to go a little deeper in this kind of, uh, of understanding. So we had those open source projects uh, funded and supported by the government. But then there was this effect that was there were empty spaces in government. And some of us came, coming from activist backgrounds were kind of dragged into it and taking, taking over those positions which made us suddenly realize that, OK, now we are the government. And I guess some of us were aware that the first thing we had to tell communities was not to trust the government, not to depend on the government, because the government will change again and will change uh, back. So we had this, this understanding that I guess is, is really well explained in a paper, uh, an article published by uh, Jamie King. Uh, that is called On the Plane of the Paraconstituted, about gang power, and how you, you don't have necessarily to, to think in terms of paraconstituted, so before you organize and you get uh, an institutional uh, arrangement, and then after that, but you have to make ways for the, the kind of open, networked, and kind of messy way of doing things to uh, to, to keep going once the institutions are gone. and. On the field, those projects, those digital cultural projects, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, described them because uh, there's been a lot being said about those. But those large-scale technology, open source technology projects, uh, they were messy, they were precarious, they were sometimes cooperating one with another, sometimes competing. And that is one of the ways, uh, one of the, the reasons I like to characterize them as a forest, a forest of ideas, a forest of projects. But it's not those, you know, over-engineering forests that you see here in the northern hemisphere. And, you, know, you know, the trees have their proper, play, proper place. And I'm talking about, you know, the Atlantic rainforest or the Amazon rainforest, in which the species kind of are messy and reproducing and experimenting and changing. And at maybe seven years ago, in Brazil, we had a very dry wind. We had a lack of water in that forest of ideas. So we had this very huge project, uh, process of desertification of that forest of projects, uh, which was a political coup followed by a right-wing government, followed by another extreme right-wing government. And in that time, there were very few surviving projects. And all, all of us had to make do doing other stuff. But that kind of the idea of a forest that we had before was transformed into a desert. And now, as things change, the elections came, uh, the dry winds are gone, and things are starting to flow, the water is starting to flow. So we think of how can we regenerate? And I think there are some lessons that we have learned during that time. And I'm trying to put that into a new project called Semente. Semente means seed in Portuguese. And I think it's important also to go deeper in the metaphor of a seed, because sometimes people think of a seed as a, a, a unit of preservation, of, uh, of genetic preservation. 
but it's also interesting to think of a seed as a way to propagate a diversity of, of genetic diversity. So instead of only having one idea that will be repeated over and over, that would be cloning, the seed is a way to create diversity and to spread the diversity and to change the conditions for uh, life to, to thrive. So the seed can be also seen uh, as a connection to the past. So every seed is a process of millions of years of evolving to get that specific uh, genetic configuration. But also, the seed can also be seen as a way to connect to the present conditions. So a seed is nothing without soil, a seed is nothing without air, a seed is, not, is nothing without sunlight and water. So what we're trying to do in this kind of with design, I'm working with this, this designer, to create a toolkit or a method to uh, to, to improve or to generate new community-based ideas is to think in terms of how do you connect to the past with a single unit. And that single unit, that is the kind of the, the, the genetic unit that we're talking about is the seed, the, the, the sementi, as we call, uh, should not be about an idea. Because you see all of those, you know, lean, whatever, methodologies, circular methodologies that are iterative, but they kind of externalize what is important and think, oh, you have to have one important idea and then you convince people to, uh, to follow, to, you know, you'll be the project leader. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to think that the seed, you know, the, the basic units should be a community. And a community is not, uh, also going deep in the, in the metaphors, a community should not be seen only as uh, a group that has one thing in common, like people who live in this neighborhood form a community because that's not a real community. Community is also a diversity of commonalities. So how can we capture this diversity of commonalities uh, and make things that make sense? And I guess uh, what we want to do and what we're trying to do and what we've done in Brazil, and this is where uh, uh, all of those learnings come from, is uh, how do you focus first on the relationships between people and then only after that, one, once you define or once you understand whom you want to talk with and whom you want to, to develop projects with, after that you start thinking of maybe that's okay, if a 3D printer is, is necessary, maybe let's use that, but maybe uh, we don't need that. Let's resort to traditional craftsmen and resort to, and this is something also that um, uh, Teresa mentioned this morning, uh, that she creates those declarations, the repair declarations in partnership with local councils, because the power is there already. The power is distributed in various ways and you have to connect to people who have uh, the ability to decide on things. Uh, so this is, I guess, the, 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 the base of what I would like to, to think in terms of how to create policy, engaging with people and creating community, but also exploring this idea of uh, a diversity of commonalities. We mm -hmm. tend to think sometimes of uh, funders and project leaders and communities, but it, will con it can only be sustainable if the funder, the person that works for the funding institution is also part of the community and feels part of the community. If the project leader is part of the community and if the stakeholders, that is a, a, a horrible name for, you know, because it removes the relationship from the, the care, the affection from the, the relationship. I guess if you try to think of all of those elements as part of the community, maybe uh, that's a good way to start. Uh, brilliant. I feel like people should be applauding right now. Um, There was a lot in there, Philippe, a lot of the different sort of tactics and strategies and lessons learned um, and how you're sort of designing this uh, approach. Um, I think one thing that I found really interesting talking to different members of our community and different representatives of what I would consider important NGOs in the Brazilian context, Data Lavi, Jill Vieira was already mentioned today, uh, Gavi Agostini from Olavi, et cetera, is that there's a sort of growing together of these NGOs. Everybody's suffering from, um, from stress and burnout issues, which we also talked about earlier, the carers who are needing care as well, but also seeing how they can connect their work in order to have more impact, in order to make also it manageable and here in Germany we've had an interesting movement of the um, green so in environment protection some very traditional NGOs also growing together with the digital rights movement in order to create a, a common space and more commonality I think this fits really well to what you were saying I would be super interested how does this relate at all to civil society in a Kenyan context what are you observing there Linda um, 
so the thing about Okay, yeah, I need to shake it a bit. Um, I was going to talk about, I like what you said about commonalities um, and um, who determines who should participate. I think that's one of the reasons, the issues that we've, we've had um, in Africa especially. So when we come on board, um, people will say, you're not civil society or you're not corporate um, or which group are you from again? Uh, and like, no, I'm not a group. I am a user of the internet and I need to be consulted on how the internet is going to be governed. And so I think that the first sort of um, definition uh, anywhere is to say that I'm here on the basis that I'm a user. Um, and I like the work, how you talked about stakeholders as well. But then also to the other lesson that we are learning is from how organizations are set up. So the lawyers have been set up as both a civil society organization, but then also as a company for two reasons. One is on sustainability, uh, because we got tired of the fact that we just don't have money because donors have not given us money. But we are lawyers who went to school. We can build products. We can train people. And so we decided to also set up as um, a corporate. But then also people come in when you go to corporates, they're like, no, don't come in. You're not civil society. And when we go to um, civil society, they're like, no, you're a company. We're like, no, we are both. We're humans. We are citizens. We'll participate. Um, and so we saw this in Uganda where a government just came one day and shut down civil society organizations because they can just shut down your your bank account um, just because you're civil society. But we realized that having a company means that they have to go to court to shut down our bank accounts. Um, and so that really helps to ensure that you're still independent and you're still able to voice these things. I also think that it, give, it gives an opportunity to be able to say no to certain funding and say, no, we can't do that. We'd rather be lawyers and make money and then come use it to make this difference. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we see it. But then also too, there's need for civil society to work together, I think everywhere, because we see it. Um, and I'm seeing this whole European digital rights movement that is doing incredible work, but I see the gap in Africa. Um, I think we've talked about this, Geraldine invited me to members of parliament um, uh, in Germany. And one of the things we noticed was that there's need for policy exchange in Africa, that other than send money and send policies to Africa, how is Africa also coming back to Europe and then learning from your systems? Um, and I say this like, I mean, want really good hair. I want Beyonce's hair, but on Linda's budget. It can't <laughs> happen um, because I don't have that kind of money. And so Africa wants Europeans' laws, but it's on own African budget and its own African structure. So we can't even afford data protection commissioners, but Europe can afford to have each every, every country, you know, running these particular projects. So I think that's, that's really key. But then also to see that um, lawmaking is just not about civil society only. I think we must progress and look at multi-stakeholder approaches because the thing is civil society is working on one corner, government is working on the other corner. How do we make sure that we break these silos um, so that civil society also has a place within, um, within the stage? And finally, Geraldine, I'm just gonna say this, that now we've become such a digital society that every law concerns digital. Um, for us to participate here today, there are people who've struggled with visa issues. And so when we ask you to get involved in visa policy, you don't see it as a problem. Uh, you see it as, a, uh, no, 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 that's not, that's ancillary. But it's a problem because then um, I've been fundraising in the US this past week. And when I go to people's office, they're like, yeah, we'll give you the money. Because now they see me, they, now they trust me. That means Africans who couldn't get visas will not raise money for their organizations. They're going to die. I think that we need to look at all these policies in a holistic approach because then it's useful to then tie the dots. I really, yeah. really thank you for mentioning this, Linda. I was going to save it for my closing remarks, but I think now is the perfect time. You know, in Germany at the moment, there's all this big talk about feminist foreign policy. And we as GIG, you know, we have gathering as the last part in our name, and that means bringing two people together in one space, and that means getting visas for people. And I just really wanted to also make sure that this is said on stage today, it is not feminist foreign policy. If you you have to buy your visa appointment on the black market and it is not feminist foreign policy if especially women get discriminated against vis getting their visas there were several people in the group where we had to provide extra documentation extra letters only because there were single women traveling and that is the opposite of feminist foreign policy so we need to change that and like you said see that holistically yeah and i think yeah i agree um and, and visas should not be expensive. How do I pay for 80 euros for a visa uh, for a year? After you spent money for the black market appointment yeah. already. And somebody paid um, the same amount of money for a 20-day visa. Like, what's that for? 
I want to open it up just very briefly before we come to a close. And there's one person I've been eyeing over because we have just recently published a study in the context of the MAKE project that we're running, the Horizon project I mentioned earlier about distributed manufacturing. And Martin was one of the providers for these case studies, leading the National Hub Association in Kenya um, that was trying to yeah, lobby for better innovation policies. Martin, can you share a few sentences quickly on that work you did and how you were trying to get a seat at the table? OK, thank you. Um, I, I thought I was tall enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, apart from other things that I do, I, I also belong to the Association of Countrywide Hubs. Uh, which I am one of the leaders, and uh, through that we have been um, uh, involved in the discussion about the, the pol some of the policies in the country. Uh, um, and Linda is aware of uh, the startup, uh, startup bill, which um, we have been able to participate at various levels, but um, of course it is still taking time for it to go through. Um, and I don't know, you wanted me uh, to talk slightly about uh, RISA Fund? Um, if you like, you can also yes, um, yes, share yes. on that. Yes. Um, uh, of course, I come from Fab Lab Winam. Fab Lab is an innovation makerspace in Kenya. And uh, we became one of the beneficiaries of RISA Fund, where um, nine makerspaces in Africa are beneficiaries, and Fab Lab Winam is one of them. So the reason or the how we became beneficiaries through distributed manufacturing is because um, you realize that when COVID-19 happened and every door, every borders were closed, everyone was struggling how to make things locally. Um, Maker spaces, uh, I believe globally, have been struggling with issues related with the um, showing that, uh, telling people that this is exactly what we do. Because if you are just working on uh, on uh, on prototyping, people really feel like it's nothing. You know, they they the potential partners only come when there is already working prototype that they can now fund. But a lot of maker spaces struggle with that. So we struggle with a lot of indicators. We struggle with. Um, the capacity to do research, which ideally maker spaces should be leading in. And of course, if you know, when it comes to prototyping in maker space, you use a lot of, um, you need machinery, you need a lot of materials, where if it goes wrong, then you've lost a lot of money in it. So that is how um, we ended up under the project called um, uh, IMA, that is Innovation Manufacturing in Africa, which is bringing together the nine makerspaces to run a test, to try, see how their indicators can be improved and they can be able to tell the world that this is the data that we have. So far, this is, the, this is how distributed manufacturing is done. Because in the project, this, uh, um, all the makerspaces are going to do the contracting of other users to see how they are able to produce some of the components or some of the parts that they can do and then sell them. Thank, Thank you. you, Martin. And that's why I think it's so important um, to have the people who are doing this work at the table, because very often, A, hardware is left out of digital um, policy conversations, and people don't understand what impacts huge uh, hardware taxes, for instance, have on the work we're doing or other policies that might seem in some way conducive to the uh, economic system of a country but are really hindering uh, grassroots innovation. So maybe as a final question, what, what, what frameworks do we need? What kind of different policies do we need? And how can we uh, support each other in getting there? One last example, perhaps from the German context, we're all going to head off to Seabase for pizza and drinks, hopefully, in a short while. Seabase lost their position as a charitable organization, being a hackerspace, because they once hosted a Go tournament, I think. So another example of volatility of, of regulation and of the effects that has on people. So yeah, what do we need? What are the frameworks we need and the kind of support uh, we can perhaps give each other in getting there? Um, I think this, um, intervention should be globalized, distributed um, in a way that it's just not here. Um, we learned that a lot of Africa's policy 
is just made in Washington or Brussels. Mm -hmm. And so Lawyers Hub is trying to set up in Brussels. If you're in Brussels, please support us um, to get our voice heard um, because our members of parliament don't have as much power as they seem. Um, and so, um, you know, how do, who makes the power? How do we find out who is this decision maker? Um, and then also, too, is to look at what stage are you at in terms of policy making? Um, the things at idea stage, like startup bill, we've seen from Senegal, from Kenya, um, from Rwanda, when it's an, a good idea, everybody buys in, government is happy with it. But the second stage is when already their positions, like for instance, it's tied to maybe some World Bank funding, and they say, you know what, if you pass this law, we give you the di digital ID money. That means then that the stakes are higher, they don't care for what civil society does, they will move on either way. And then finally, to look at future stuff. Like, I really like the idea today about the right to repair. Nobody will refuse such a law at this point. But the moment it's pushed, let's say, by the big multinationals in Africa, then people will take a position and they don't care what civil society you know, um, is bringing on the table. So I think that's, that's very useful. But then finally, we need people on the table Come in as speakers. If you understand something, like for us, we would really love an exchange. Um, there's something that you're doing here. The business model is already, or the, or the methodology is established. We can pair you up with somebody in Africa. And I think that's why um, Gig is such a, a powerful platform, that we can just simply look and say, Brazil is doing this thing. It works for them. Can it work in Africa? We hosted 113 webinars in 2020 during COVID. There were over 30,000 unique attendees on our platform that year. And we learned something that... Africans talk, like you see on this stage, I am talking. We like to talk because sometimes we think action is impossible, but we want to talk about it and get to learn these things. Come on board and help us train. Ken is an amazing ma man, he's uh, back there. Um, Ken, please wave. Um, he does all the amazing videos that the lawyers have. Please say hi to him and, and yeah, thank you. And he's also my brother. Um, so, yeah, so um, how do we convene and bring all these voices to also speak to our context? Um, I think that will be useful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Any closing thoughts from you on this, Felipe? Um, I would like to emphasize the need to go beyond the perceived walls of institutional representation. And uh, to think of that, that's something that we have to relate to, we have to influence official regulations, legislation, policy, but with, as we suggested in Brazil for the government when we were government, don't rely on that, don't trust, and go beyond those kind of official and authorized ways to influence what happens in the world. I have this short example of one, uh, uh, I think that happened once, in a free, free software forum that was organized by the Brazilian government. Uh, one person from the Telecentros in Sao Paulo went to this event and got to know our project that was this you know, computer reuse, recycling with free software. And that person came back to Sao Paulo and gathered her team, you know, 15, 20 people working in the Telecenter project. It was, then it was the biggest implementation of, of GNOME uh, desktop environment. Uh, and she got her team and said, yeah, I met these guys in this uh, uh, free software forum in Porto Alegre, and we want to hire Meta Reciclagem to help us to shape the digital strategy for the Waste Pickers Collective or something like that. And then three people from, the, from their team raised their hands and said, yeah, I am part of Meta Reciclagem, so what are you talking about? So that person did not understand that she thought, she, she thought that she would be able to hire this institution to help them, but there were people in her team that were already uh, part of that community, that network. And that was interesting because it entitled them to, pro to, to propose different policies and different projects inside the, go 